This is going to sound like an insult, but it's actually a compliment. I admire Ken more since he left <laughs> than because this past five years, Ken came here about seven or eight years ago with his family, he was assistant pastor here, um, then had to return back to America. And this past five years have been the opposite of easy for Ken and his family, has been brutal. Um, and he loves Jesus more. So I admire him more because what they have gone through and what they've experienced this past five years has really been, it, it's not the Ukraine, but there's different types of awful. Um, and it has been awful, and he just keeps pointing to Jesus. So, Ken, it's a privilege more than ever to have you here. Do you want this? Yeah. That's really all I, I came here for. I'm done. So God bless you guys, Father, Son. Just kidding. Yeah, right, while you're on top. <laughs> Sorry. So Sean just said, whatever you do, don't make a bad impression. And I failed to get my sermon printed on time. So it looks cool, but actually printing, uh, speaking from the computer was not the plan, and then I tried to pour a glass of water earlier and spilt it all over my shirt and my trousers, so I'm not that old yet where I've lost control of my bladder. <laughs> Just wanna, I do look a lot older, but I'm not that old yet. Um, gosh, it's really good to be here. We have missed you guys. And so before I even say anything, just hear the greetings from Ava and Jody from 4,000 miles away wishing and Micah wishing they could be here. And uh, our hope and our prayer is that we'll be back here this summer and get to worship with you all and spend time and eat amazing barbecue um, that I'll probably end up cooking if Sean. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, a, it's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to worship with you guys. And Sean is correct. The last few years have been really difficult. And so when he asked me to come and speak, I said, you know, is there a topic? Is there a sermon series? And he said, could you talk about how Jesus has been present in the midst of trouble? And honestly, Marina said it so clearly that it is because of God that we can even make it through difficult things. And all of us at some point in our life will go through kind of hard things and some of us will go through really difficult things and some of us will go through absolute, absolutely terrible things. And so what I, what I hope to do today is share with you guys what we've learned about Jesus in the midst of the trials and the difficulties that we've been through. And before I get started with that, let me just pray, okay? Holy Spirit, we just invite you. We know that you're present, but we invite you to draw closer. Open up our hearts to that which you would have us hear. Lord, I thank you for this church. It is a place of joy. It is a place of welcome and is a place that exemplifies your love for a community. And so would you grow that in all of us today and tomorrow and the days to come? And Lord, whatever you want us to hear, that's, I pray that I would get out of the way and that's what folks would hear. In Jesus' name, amen. So, <clears throat> I'm gonna share, start with a verse that I wanna share with you that's been in my thoughts. It's James chapter one, short, Verses 2 through 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. I don't like this verse. I don't. Did anybody else out there not like this verse? You know? Yeah. During the midst of COVID, Micah and I, we started this really small marketing agency, and I can tell you with authority, that's really bad marketing on God's part. <laughs> it's trials of many kinds. So you don't even just get like the occasional, you know, similar trial. You get many kinds of trials. 
it's just not good. And I think that, you know, I've talked to the Lord about it, but he doesn't really seem to care what my opinion is. Um, in fact, I wrote a different one that I can't, no, my screen doesn't want to work. There we go. Yeah, I think what it should say is consider it pure joy when you follow Jesus because everything will go well for you and you won't have any difficulty and your entire life will be filled with chips and sweets that you'll never gain weight from. <laughs> Who likes that one better? <laughs> Me too. Yeah, it's just not that way. And honestly, life is not that way. And you know that and I know that. And we see that in the news. We see it in our day-to-day -day lives. And so we have to wrestle a bit with why would James say consider it pure joy? Because we know trials are going to come. We know that we're going to run up against difficulties. But why would we consider it joy? Shouldn't we sort of be frustrated and, and fight back against it? And I, I think there is place, like nobody welcomes trouble. Nobody welcomes trials. But I've been wrestling with that first part. And I think I've learned some of the answers. There's a phrase a good Irish friend of mine says all the time, inside the infinite love of God, there is a place for suffering. When we say, when we begin to place our faith in Jesus, we're invited into a story that at, at its fulcrum, right, we just celebrated Easter, at its fulcrum is filled with suffering. And we watch how Jesus went through it, and we recognize that we don't have a Savior that doesn't understand what we experience, that doesn't understand the pain that we can go through. And so I think that's one of the first joys. You and I have the opportunity for a relationship with Jesus, not a Savior who, who, who is sitting up on a high throne, who you know, when he was here on earth, not a savior who was wealthy, who commanded political respect, but a savior who went through intense suffering, intense betrayal, and intense pain for our sake. That's powerful. When you think of all of the other religions and the gods of the world, none of them went through that for their people. Jesus did that for us. And we can take joy in the recognition that he understands. What I believe James is inviting us to is also the understanding that when we go through suffering, what's actually happening is God is growing us. And I'm going to share a little bit of our story because that's really the, the part that I think we have learned, that in that God is growing us. How many of you have ever played a sport or taken up running or weightlifting or anything like that? How do you get better at a sport? You... Yeah, you train. You have to push yourself, right? If you could get better at a sport by sitting in a chair and yelling at the television, I would be the captain of Leinster right now. <laughs> you have to train, right? You have to work at it. It's the same way in education. The further that you push yourself, the more that you try to learn, the better you become at it. It's the same way in your work, your employment. The harder you work at it, the more you excel. And it's the exact same way in our faith. What God does, whenever, can we go back to that James 3, I mean, verse 3? Yeah. What, what James is saying is, whenever you face trials of many kinds, what's happening is the testing of your faith, and what that does is it produces perseverance. Now, I have zero desire to run a marathon. I was not, this body was not, it's not marathon wiring, right? Prop, front row rugby. <laughs> That, you know, I had a guy walk up to me yesterday. He's like, you're a hooker, aren't you? Now, if you're familiar with rugby, hooker is a position. Sorry. Just any Americans, <laughs> any Americans in the crowd? They're like, what? <laughs> Why? Because five foot eight square. That's true. But even to be better at that, I have to work harder. I have to get stronger. I have to be, you know, in better shape. To become a pastor, you know, one of the things that makes Sean such, Sean and Debbie such great pastors is that they're constantly growing. We, when we met the other day, we we're sitting in a coffee shop and we're talking and they're relating books that they're reading and how Jesus is changing their life and shaping them and forming them. Our faith is exactly like that. And what happens in trials is it's almost like a, a expediting of that growing, an expediting of 
what God is building in us. All right, so let me share a little bit because this is, uh, I'm telling you, this sermon's brilliant. It's the computer's fault. (laughs) So when we were here in 2017, um, forgot my water. Dangerous. (laughs) They raised the stage so I couldn't reach it. Um, When we were here in 2017, you know, our family had been here for about two and a half years We recognized that the Lord was taking us back to Texas, not something that we wanted, um, but because of some family challenges, we knew that was the right thing to do. And 20, most of 2017 was relatively, like we were getting settled in, we're enjoying being back in Galveston, eating seafood, eating barbecue, gaining weight, (laughs) not not Jody, but me. Um, And we came back in, in July and August, And so a very good friend of mine, Mary Byrne, has prayed for our family in the past and has heard words from the Lord. So I know you guys are familiar with that here. And I said, Mary, could you, we're going to be here for a month. Could you listen for us? We're asking the Lord what's next. We didn't think we were leaving Dublin. We don't know really what we're supposed to do. And so... We went through that month, and I'm telling you this story because it's, it's an example of God's faithfulness, okay? It's not about me. It's not really even about me. It's about how faithful God is. So at the end of that month, we were here for our last Sunday, and I walked up to Mary, and I said, Mary, have you been, because now let me tell you, all the other words that Mary had given were like really good. They were like, one of them was, you see yourself coming in a rowboat, but God sees you coming in a cruise ship. I'm like, I like that. You know, (laughs) and then, you know, other words about like growing and really enjoying Dublin and God doing all these things. And so I thought, oh, man, she's going to have something good. Like we're going to win the lottery or something. (laughs) And Mary did this. She put her head down. I said, what's going on? She said, well, I didn't really want to tell you. I was hoping you wouldn't ask. So we stepped right over here and she said, Ken, I prayed and the vision that God gave me is you and Micah and, and Ava and Jody under a tarp, and a storm is raging around you, and it's almost like it's trying to kill you. And the tarp is being ripped and torn and shredded, and it's raining, and you're huddled together. I was like, and then we went and won the lottery? <laughs> and I said, hey, thank you for being faithful would you pray for us? And she said, absolutely. I will keep praying for you. Did I get it? I I think I'm pretty close. Leaving some other parts out. I will tell you that at the end of that trip, before we went home, Jody ended up in the A&E, ill. Um, On the flight back, I developed pulmonary embolisms. Micah became ill. We went back three weeks later. There was a literal hurricane in Galveston. Not long after that, we realized that one of the reasons that God had gone, had taken us back home was because our eldest daughter was having a lot, a lot of troubles. And as a result of one of the, some of the decisions that she made, Jody and I ended up raising a little guy. I'm just being very transparent. Don't be uncomfortable. There's a point. Okay. We ended up raising a little guy named Caleb that so many of you have prayed for because in November of 2018, Caleb was diagnosed with leukemia. And we spent the following nine and a half months living in a hospital watching a baby fight for his life. And let me just pause for a second. A lot of you were aware of that, and you supported us, and you, you prayed for us. And we are so grateful. Because of all the things that we experienced, I will tell you, that one was hell. There's nothing. I wouldn't wish childhood cancer on my very worst enemy. It's terrifying. And the reason that I shared this story with you about Mary's word is twofold. One, praying for each other and listening for each other and being faithful to what God gives you, even when it doesn't sound nice, is really, really important because there were nights in the intensive care unit when they were resuscitating this little baby that we had fallen in love with. And the only thing I knew 
and I mean this, the only thing that we clung to was that God is with us because he told us it was going to happen. We did not have extraordinary faith. We didn't have some sense of like, well, Jesus, is, Jesus was close, but not because we felt it or because of something we did. We had one thing that we clung to, and that was the love and the faithfulness of God. And when you experience trials, as I know some of, many of you have, and particularly Marina's family, I want to encourage you to understand that God's love and faithfulness is with you when things are going really well, and God's love and faithfulness is with you when things are going horrible, because His love and faithfulness never changes. It never changes. In the midst of being in the hospital, my wife's dad passed unexpectedly. Sorry, my hands are shaking worse because I got emotional. I need to tell a joke real quick. <laughs> in the midst of that, um, yeah, my, my father-in-law, whom I loved and my wife loved dearly, just died unexpectedly. Our son, Micah, that many of you know, last year was in and out of the hospital with diabetes issues. I could do, like, I'm not going to give you the whole laundry list, um, but here's what we've learned. That God is real. We learned in the hospital that he still performs miracles, that he's still actively working on our behalf, bringing people to him and healing them, and then turning them outward. And we learn something else, that in the midst of extreme sorrow and difficulty, there is joy. And what James is saying is, don't go looking for trouble, okay? That's not necessarily the point of this verse. But what he is saying is that the joy that you can experience in the midst of it is not because of whether or not you're strong enough to face what's happening, not because of whether or not you're smart enough to get yourself out of the trouble that you've been through, but because you are loved by Jesus and he will never, ever depart from you. The little guy, by the way, is four now, totally leukemia-free, runs the house, complete, like, fearless. And uh, we talk about it, you know, it's like he does insane things. He climbs trees and cabinets and all kinds of stuff and gives Jody heart attacks. And Micah, of course, being a little bit cynical, always goes, well, what's going to kill him now? Like, you already beat Like, <laughs> Well, I might. <laughs> but no, not really. He's doing really well. Um, Micah also is doing really well. So a lot of those stories, Jody, Jody's experienced incredible healing from the Holy Spirit over losing her dad in such a terrible way. And our family has experienced that. And so what I'd love to do is stand up here and tell you about all the great things, but I don't think that's the picture of your life. I don't think it's a picture of mine, and I don't think it gives us hope and encouragement to what God wants to do when we are going through things. And I know that all of you, all of you have lost something in the last few years, even if it's just that you lost your freedom to move about however you wanted to. You know, we, we in America, COVID lockdown has been very, even in Texas, um, despite, <laughs> despite our governor, um, I won't get down that road. We've lost something. We've, we've lost friends. We've lost people in our church, right? You guys have probably lost loved ones unexpectedly to this weird virus. Jesus wants to meet you in that. He wants to build your faith. So I want to leave you with a couple of verses. This one has been amazingly helpful to me because one of the questions that you ask when you're going through trouble, right, is what did we do wrong? Is anybody else, what did we do wrong? God, what did we, did we do something wrong? Did we make a mistake? I know Jody at one point was, you know, she really, she sat up in bed one day and she said, we didn't do what he wanted us to do. He must be angry. I mean, it's just a moment of tiredness. And I, I return to this verse often. Paul writes, and I am convinced that nothing, fill in the blank, COVID, war, mistakes, 
failures, trial, tribulation, hurricanes, illness, nothing can ever separate you from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude in just a moment, but I want to share one more with you that kept us in the midst of real struggle. And I, I used to, it's from Isaiah, Isaiah, did we get it? Yeah. I used to read this verse and I would read it for myself. And as I was preparing for today, I, I started looking into it a little deeper. Actually, when Isaiah is prophesying this, he's prophesying it over the entire nation of Israel. Sometimes when people quote this, they're, you know, it's for you, it's for me, but it's actually for all people. It's for all of God's people. And so when I, when, when I read it, actually, could we all read it together? Is that unusual? Okay. So let's read it together, okay? And you, if you, um, if English isn't your first language, feel free to, if you can translate it, speak it out loud, whatever works for you. But God is speaking this over all of us. And one of the things that's been really helpful for me is the fear part. And I don't know if you guys wrestle with fear, um, but it's been difficult. So let's read this together. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. 